Welcome to Rally Bites on the 19th of January uh, 2015. Uh, we have a guest on today, Alan Watt and Thomas Sheridan, and we're going to be discussing the music industry. Are you there, guys? Yep. Hi, Neil. I'm here. Hi, Thomas. Hi. You're, you're both clear. Great. Okay, um, I suppose just briefly, uh, just introduce yourself and your your actual experience in the music industry in, in about you know a couple of minutes, if you can, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, anybody can go first. Yeah, well, I could start if you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, sure. Yeah, the, 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 I think everyone tends to go into the music industry pretty young. And uh, you have your basic ideas everyone else has of what it's all about, which is generally all completely wrong. And uh, if you're any good at all, you, uh, you're picked pretty quickly uh, by the image makers. Uh, and then you get into the, the, the real inner core Gradually, there's different layers of it, naturally, depending on what your, your, your abilities are. But if you're good at songwriting, music uh, construction, etc., um, you, you can get picked to go up the, up the ladder a little bit. Uh, and again, it's like an apprenticeship because you find out, you're, you're told really what they're after. Uh, music isn't spontaneous as we're taught it is. Uh, it just comes out of nowhere by a little garage bands. What's to be popular is planned in advance by uh, a machinery, I call it machinery, of uh, experts that run the culture business. And it really is a, a culture business. I mean, no mistake, it's, not, um, it's nothing to do with spontaneity as such. It's very well directed. They know where they want to take the culture, uh, how they want to alter a culture. That's a big, big part of it. And uh, I guess from really from the, the, the it's actually earlier than the, even the 60s, but from the 60s onwards, um, they knew what they wanted to do with the altering the Western society altogether, not just movies, but definitely music. Music's a very, very ancient technique of changing and getting through to the youth, especially for many reasons, and even for using it for revolution in ancient times and even uh, through uh, the 18, 1700s, through opera even, you know. So you find, you start to catch on uh, what's what. Um, and if you're clever enough, you catch on not to sign your name off the bat to anything at all because you, you get to know the different bands, especially if you're doing the session work and things like that. Many of the bands actually are put together out of uh, just a lineup of guys that are picked. The cover stories brought in, how they've known each other for years, is generally awfully, uh, 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 very often fake, not always, and uh, and are given a lot of publicity if they want to get, get them a hit or two, or maybe more, in fact. But um, the direction of the music is always, uh, and what's going to get bought for a song, for instance, is is told. You're told what's what, what they want, basically, um, right down to political correctness, it's all, as it updates society right down to you can't mention um, gender-specific words in a song. And so her has to go and etc. And, until it can be sung by anybody. Th- th- this comes from the top, believe you me. Uh, it's not so much what the people would like in a bar, if it was all left to bar music or club music. It's what's going to be made popular and famous from the top down. And uh, my experiences really were, were quite something right down to seeing, at one point, uh, a panel of people at the BBC in London who uh, picked what was going to be the, the number one for the week or ne- the next month or even. And there are a whole bunch of people around the table, all about middle-aged, um, sometimes some of them older, uh, dressed in tweeds, including the women. And uh, uh, you think they have nothing in common with the particular music that's getting pushed. But they were the ones who were deciding uh, what they're going to push to be number one, two, three, etc., uh, for the next coming uh, week uh, and then the month as well. And uh, it was astonishing to get this insight into how the whole machinery actually works. The idea is to get a lot of youthful guys, especially at that time, and now it's women too, young girls, to try to emulate what they see as a star. It's much like winning the lotto. If you're, the working class people are taught that if you might get up there if, you are, if you're good at sports or something like that. You might get one in a million chance of getting up there, making money. But so you, all the, 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 the youthful characters join in. It doesn't matter what kind of music is getting pushed out, and they try to emulate it, thinking if they emulate it, they'll, they'll simply just get up there and, and be stinking rich, have all the women and all the rest of it, and have a great time. And it doesn't work quite like that at all. The guys who pick you up, uh, uh, the, the big managers at the top, the ones who work for the record companies, 
um, immediately get your right down to uh, uh, signing on their contracts. You must produce so many albums a year, things like that. Uh, plus, they'll put you on tour, and you're worked off your feet because you can hardly any sleep. You should travel. You're doing live shows to promote, and at the same time, too, uh, you've got to put your albums out as well. Often they can't do it, so what they do instead is they'll, they'll when they've got an album due, uh, they'll hire someone to write the music for them. Um, you'll often sell it for peanuts, by the way. It depends uh, who comes to you and asks you for you know, 12 to 16 songs. And, um, and uh, then it goes under the band's name, of course. And in actual, actual fact, someone else, not even the person who wrote it, it, owns the copyright for it all. That's very, very common. Um, there's also places they can go to in certain countries, like, like France. Uh, Paris has got a place where a lot of musicians uh, can go there uh, in, in a little club, you might say, and you put your songs in, and someone will buy them for a big band or whatever it happens to be, or for a solo artist that they're going to make popular. At the time, you don't know who they're going to give it to, so you don't know much to ask for. So there's not really as much money in it as you would think. So the whole system is really rigged. Uh, from from the very very top, it's a completely closed system at the top. This machinery, and uh, that's how I found. <laughs> as I went through the many many years, that's what I found over and over again. Um, it's nothing like it's presented to the public. Does there, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> okay, okay, Thomas, what was what was your uh, start off and experience? Yeah, I, I would basically concur with everything Alan said. Now, I. It, my first encounter with the music industry, as opposed to being a guitar player in bands, the industry now, was I was about 18 and I was walking down the street in Dublin with a guitar case in my hand, having just come back from a rehearsal with the band I was with at the time. And this well-dressed, quite nice guy, the guy in the say was I say his early 30s, very well-spoken, obviously highly educated, a guy from money background, and this is something that when I went to New York, I found the same. That the people there's a there's a strange aristocratic subculture in all this within management and uh, within the music industry, and in these uh, like promoters and king makers and star makers, and they're very well spoken, obviously highly educated. And he told me, "Would you be interested in joining a band?" He's putting together. And I was like, yeah, it's, I mean, it was very impressionable and very very gullible and very young and naive back then. And uh, I had a few talks with him over the phone, and I met him for coffee a few times. And he told me that, I, I was telling him, look, I'm not that good of a guitar player. And I said, I don't, don't have to worry about it. It's not That's not important. You look good. And uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll do a photo shoot with my wife, who was a photographer, and so they were putting a band together. There was no interest in really the standard of, of my musicianship. I was p- pick, picked purely on the basis that I was, I was young and pretty and I had a guitar. And they were putting together basically a Duran Duran Spandau Ballet type group uh, to cash in in a kind of a business sense in that way. Now, when I met them, they were very, very charming. And these people are actually still heavily involved in entertainment, although they've moved into theater today. But they were, you know, they're part of that whole entertainment industrial complex. And they were very charming. But there was times I could see that they would switch to charm off and it would be kind of cold and hard. Like, I can remember one time we were t- when they were planning the group. Now, it never got... I, I, I left before the thing actually took off, and it never went, it fell apart. But she was... His wife was giving me, uh, basically... This is this ties in what Alan was saying. Was giving me information. That went, he says, when we put you out there, she, she said, you just keep your, your effing mouth closed. Say nothing and only say what we tell you to say. And that was a real kind of a wake-up call for me because that was, see, before that point, I thought like playing in a band or being in the music industry was like being a footballer. You know, if you could play football and you were good at it, you got to play for a team, you may become professional, you may become very rich, you may be very successful. That was the beginning when I, when I was at the point where I realized that that, the music industry did not function that way. You were basically a product you were, and your your product was placement was putting you in the right 
delivery package that they were putting for the public and that was a continuum both that the idea that the music was simply or the singer was simply a product in a product placement package coupled with the fact that the people behind this that I'd met as I progressed through it all tend to be highly educated from top universities Cambridge Ivy League schools in America and so on and uh, and that's basically it. From that point on, I realized that the whole thing was basically a theater that was designed, that, that fame and success and accolades was totally based on doing exactly what you were told and keeping your mouth shut and playing and, not, and, and doing what they wanted from you. Yeah, I mean, you... Um... I could add to that, if I, if I, if I might, yeah, the... I've been present uh, in the groups that helped choose some of these people uh, for bands, etc. And uh, I got to know the ones. Uh, see, there's see, there's different ranks. It's almost a need to know basis as to the different levels that you, you get into. And I got to know some of them. And, and I'd seen them uh, already pick stars, to make stars. And what they had um, for one guy um, who had a few hits, uh, he was told where he was picked out a lineup of guys who all had to be the same height. They wanted only guys at a certain height and a build uh, to, 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 to turn up for the additions. And um, they already had all the drawings of what he was going to wear, this leather outfit, very tight fitting, uh, diamond bracelets on his, on his wrists and things like that. He'd, right down to the posture, he would hold the mic at, they all had to have a gimmick, a stick, you see. It's all done beforehand, before they even pick the person that they're going to go out there and who's going to do the acting, you might say. And uh, eventually they picked one of them. I knew, him. I knew him. He was a club singer. He was pretty good at, at being a club singer. And uh, I met him afterwards, too. He was told he'd make three hits, and then he would just fade away, uh, etc. Uh, the, 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 the songs were already written in advance, uh, right down to the timing of when they would be released every, every six months or whatever it was. And... Um, that's really how it's done. I've been present too when they pick people for, say, London rock musicals, things like that. And I've been involved in writing some of that stuff, but um, it's nothing like the people are actually uh, taught at the bottom level. You're kept in utter ignorance. That's the way they want it. But there's more than that to it. There's a big, massive social agenda behind it, and that got me interested in finding out well, what is this big machinery behind it all? Why? Why is it so intense, uh, the, the control of it all? Why don't they let people at the very bottom um, put out their own stuff and, and, and see where it goes by itself? Uh, no, they want to lead everybody. Uh, and, and actually, that, what it does is it kills originality at the bottom level because everyone starts to copy, you see. Now, they'd already tried this. There's a whole history to it. They tried this with uh, the folk music era. The revival of the folk music started, uh, as you know, in, in New York. It was heavily communistic. And, and they set up camps across the U.S. and Canada and Britain, too, where students could go and get trained and picked if they were all kind of uh, Marxist or, or Trotskyist, as they like to call it at then, in the in, in early 60s. And they trained them. And, and they also had managers who would turn up there, and they would pick the ones they were going to promote in the folk business. And I remember there was a famous... Um, scene where they had the big uh, 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 folk festival with Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan was also groomed for, for years for his particular part in all of this to change the culture, um, for the counterculture, they called it. And uh, everything at that time was acoustic. It was almost uh, it become a religion. It was acoustic. And uh, there were some bands that with electric guitars at the time, but it hadn't caught on yet because it wasn't pushed. And so during that one concert, um, he, he pulled out his electric guitar and started playing for the first time. So when Bob Dylan, who they're, they'd already made a star with acoustic, and I mean made a star, because a lot of his songs weren't even his, uh, there's a shock in the whole f folk music era, you know. Like a traitor had happened. What do you do when the star is now a traitor? Uh, but in actual fact, he was leading the way for them all to go into purely electronic and um, some of the guys, even the guys from the Weavers, who were also part of this big communistic counterculture, and I mean communistic, they wanted a, a kind of communist, not quite the same as the, as the Soviet system, they wanted the society to come in. And it was getting funded, by the way, from the very top, with, with professors from university, uh, by governmental money. Uh, and heavily involved was, was, was MI5, uh, at the very top, a high level in Britain, 
and the CIA and, and the U.S. especially, they got the idea, you see, uh, from during World War II, what were they going to do with a post-war Germany and a post-war Japan? And they put teams of people on, at work to decide what kind of culture to bring in and how, how is culture guided and created and so on. Well, it's always music, movies, dramas, and things like that, and young folk emulate it as well as what you're going to teach them through education. And um, it was so successful uh, that they thought they'd, they'd also use it on the West because the whole world was to change. Uh, you're still thinking nationalistic, but the CIA and these boys were internationalists from the very beginning. It was to bring in a world culture, but a directed culture of people who would behave and, and do what they wanted them to do and, and not cause waves and just go along with the flow. Um, that's what it was. So if they directed all culture, uh, all thought, you might say, um, emotion and so on, uh, you could control a whole world this way. And so they, they adapted that and brought it into the States under the, the, the Communistic League. Uh, and believe you me, it, it wasn't the Soviets who was guiding this. It was, uh, it was inside the U.S. Uh, very high, rich people. Rockefellers were involved heavily, in fact. Uh, he, his different uh, foundations, the, the brothers, the three brothers foundations, funded an awful lot of this stuff. Uh, down to the, the buildings they would use where they'd be taught and everything else. And the big camps for teaching students uh, what the agenda was. And um, that's what confused the people. They always, always thought in left versus right. They couldn't understand that above all of this is one system controlling both sides of it all. And, but music was an awfully, awfully important part. And so what they did to change it over uh, from, from the, the, um, the ones who were pushing the communistic uh, free love and all this kind of thing to destroy families, etc., let's all be happy in one, uh, they brought in all the electronic stuff and they created Laurel Canyon, for instance, in California, and uh, Frank Zappa was set up there. And Laurel Canyon, this was to guide the whole music industry for the whole of the U.S. And top established stars were brought in, uh, and other ones people had hardly heard of were brought in and were made famous there. The mamas and the papas went there to, to learn their stuff. Frank Zappa ended up kind of running the, the show. He was a big guru there eventually. And you, you find that... Um, uh, the big players who were given authority by the CIA and the Pentagon to run this whole counterculture, uh, Stuart Brand uh, and, and people like that, who, who was into cybernetics and counterculture, etc., uh, and a whole bunch of these people um, were pushing LSD as well. LSD was getting thrown out by the bucket loads, literally on, on, on tours with the, the group that preceded the Grateful Dead. There's a whole history to this. Folk think it just evolved all by itself, and nothing, nothing is further from the truth. Uh, I'm sure most of the readers uh, and listeners know uh, that the LSD experiments were always led by military-industrial complex for control purposes, see what it did, and so on. The CIA ran experiments with the LSD, full, full-time experiments, hiring prostitutes uh, all over the U.S., having the, the uh, uh, cameras in all the prostitutes' uh, rooms and so on, houses, and they'd bring in all these johns, thousands and thousands over many years, to see the, the effect as the, as the prostitute would slip different drugs into their drink, including LSD. I mean, why so much? It was, it was amazing. And then they, they, they brought out um, a different guy. Like I think, I think it was um, the guy who was involved with the previous co- uh, group to the Grateful Dead, that actually pushed uh, the LSD from a bus, and, and, and it was merely Merry Pranksters, it was called. And these professors went along with them, like Stuart Brand and so on. These guys were all top military guys, uh, Stuart Brand. And, um, uh, and Kesey is another guy, too, who went around with them as well. He was also military. They were dishing out bucket loads of LSD and promoting this whole free culture thing. So much so that the Unabomber, if you remember the Unabomber, uh, he he knew these professors and these guys who were top authors and and star makers. He knew these guys who worked at universities and so on, and who were directing this. And they'd experimented on him when he was a student in some experiments. And when he realized uh, when what the whole agenda was to be was to literally bomb out a whole generation to completely destroy all the morals, all, all, all the culture that was, to bring in a new man-made, planned culture for everyone. He thought it was horrific, and that's what started him off, in fact, when he was a professor himself. 
So uh, that's why he attacked certain people. And if you look at the names of the people he was attacking, these were the very guys who were involved with the military. They were given military hangers to experiment with the strobe lights, uh, drugs, and so on, uh, and then get youth, a lot of youth in, watch them dancing to see if they would end up losing all inhibitions and have literally orgies and things like that, to see if that would work. Then they could put it on the whole population. This is an incredible, massive um, experiment that was going on. But they'd learned it all, as I say, from the guys who were put in in charge of America's cultural Cold War, that's what they called it, against, uh, say, um, uh, Russia, uh, but definitely against Germany. That was their big testing bed, and then Japan as well. And they said, if it works there, and we can literally shape a whole culture to be obedient and so on, we can use a different uh, method to make them obedient and so on in, in the West, but use some of the same tactics. So that, that really is how, how... It's so involved, actually, you could write stacks of books on it, but um, I've seen it at work, and I've been pulled in at times as well, um, where bands couldn't couldn't uh, keep up and get their albums out for their contract. If they didn't do, produce and so on, uh, they'd get threatened with lawsuits. And what actually happened, generally, was uh, they simply worked for free for the next few years to pay off what would have been supposedly the claim from the lawsuit. And they'd pull you in or pull me in or some other guy and you'd have to go in and write their stuff for them and arrange the music and sometimes play the tracks from and even play most of the music for, for the whole so-called band and, and you got paid a set fee. And even then I refused to go through contracts. The only thing you could do is sign non-disclosure so you wouldn't say that you ever had anything to do with it. But, but you got a set fee and that was it. And that, that suited me fine because I wasn't owned like these guys were all owned. Yeah. Oh, Thomas? Yeah, when, when pop music was really starting to mean something in people's lives, and large, when the music industry was really taking off, they, that's when you had the growth of things like uh, the School of the Performing Arts in New York, places like Juilliard, and governments taking a strong interest in these. And they were both very heavily and still are influenced by the new school in lower manhattan now the new school was basically the frankfurt institute or the frankfurt school transported yeah. to the united states the purpose of this was not to harness up and coming talent in pop music see we, we always you know what i was saying about laurel canyon that's the, that's true in the kind of focus we forget that pop music has been very very engineered too from day one even more so and places like the school of the performing arts this was not to develop talent. This was to get people at a young age, we're talking high school age now, who were, say, good singers, good songwriters, had an ability to actually reach people. They'd be spotted very, very quickly. They'd be put into these schools, and they would get a highly academic education into music that really was not necessary because what they were basically doing was, uh, was pop music. They were just singing and songwriters that were developing but the main thing was to do two things was to filter out any one of them who probably had a mind of their own and would actually probably write pop songs that could actually you know make people think for, for a change and on the other hand to get the ones who would actually finish these high schools these like the school of the performing arts which we know from the tv show and the t and the movie fame would to be to social engineered them if you watch it you know to have them make sure that when they graduated as a pop singer they were actually singing about themes basically cultural marxism delivered in a very kind of namby pamby uh, manner and to produce songwriters who would write lyrics and themes within songs that would actually apply to the social agenda going forward, particularly to dumb down, to take any kind of deep meaning out of lyrics or to anything like that, to reduce them down to sort of childish metaphors or kind of uh, simplified, emotionally mushy statements that have no real depth to them, while wrapping it up in this idea that they're somehow they're, they're the elect. They are the, the, the best of the best in America. They've been brought to Juilliard. They've been brought to the new school. They've been brought to the school of performing arts to be the best and to be and to be the, the, the elite. And then they would play on their narcissism and their egos of kids at, at an age when you are narcissistic and highly egotistical and, br and bring them up this way. And then if any of them had any success from these schools, which re in reality very few do, 
And if the ones who did have success from these schools were people who their parents were already famous, such as Liza Minnelli, her mother was Judy Garland, but anyone else really just ended up probably just playing guitar in, a, in, a, in an off-Broadway production or in an, they were lucky got into an orchestra. And it was a way for the establishment to grab and steal and co-op, just like they've done with the, the, the visual arts, to, to take the ones that really have something to say and have them working for them and to also filter out anyone that could be a potential troublemaker. From very, very early on, the music industry was was instantly recognized as a social engineering tool, and that's why they integrated it so much into education. I mean, Harvard, you know, Harvard University has a big performing arts section, and that's the same thing there. They, they want to take people that could probably be top singers and, and to move them into things like Broadway shows and stuff like that, where they'll never really say anything other than singing Singing, singing Stephen Sondheim lyrics that will just promote the agenda as well. It's really, people have no idea how deep it is. It's very, very deep. There are no accents it's, it's, in the top it's, it's of the music even, it's, even it's even older, actually, than that, because Hollywood in the 30s was putting out a lot of musicals of, of its day. And movies. Uh, and so these movies, again, are really affected. They're aimed at the young. It's always aimed at the youth, you see. And uh, there was one, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it's a song and dance type musical. And you see a, a young couple at the end of a table, a long table, and forming an arch. They're at the very end of the table, forming an arch all along the table. as other young dancers, stacks of them in a long row with their legs apart. And the young couple are looking through between the legs to the camera. And, and the song they sang was Stay young and beautiful if you want to be loved The message was to separate the genders When you're young, you think you're always going to be young You can't relate to the older That was the whole message Because we're going to give you a new This is your world now And you are going to lead it That was the message And of course, they were actually led by the nose Quite simply But they didn't know it They were egotistical, etc But that was the message And they put lots of movies out like that At that particular era Then during World War II uh, they really hyped it up with with the kind of jazz kind of jazz sound and the kind of early early um, swing you might call it where they could swing the girls over their back they 'd wear shorter skirts you 'd see everything once when they went over the guy 's back uh, that was to get the sexual thing going and uh, the idea was that, uh, that if they could destroy monogamy, a person who would simply team up and mate and bond with the person they're going to have sex with, then they could literally uh, control every individual as an individual instead of having you against the whole family unit. That was always the enemy of, uh, of centralized government. Families are simply a small tribe. Uh, when they go after one person, the whole family can stand up. If they have a lot of th- culture in common, then the whole community will stand up for them against the government. And that had to be destroyed. And lots of books were written uh, in the early 1900s about this, this problem, how to control all of the people and eliminate that type of problem with families standing up with common culture, destroy the common culture, isolate the individuals, and that's easy to do. But always go for the youth, and, and because the youth... Uh, if you if you keep feeding them uh, egotistical ideas, they'll believe you. Uh, yeah, this is our time. This is you know talking about my generation, like the song goes, and things that these were all put out on purpose for a very very big uh, um, uh, agenda. Uh, it's easier to, to to lead young, egotistical, and ignorant youngsters because we're all like, ignorant when we're teenagers and early twenties. Um, we have no wisdom. We haven't matured yet. Uh, but you think you have. You think you know it all. Uh, and it's easy to be guided by guys they put out there to be your leaders and the guys you're taught to admire that say the cool things or even obnoxious things, or, et cetera, to, to, to scare society. Uh, that was well understood by psychologists that were all working on board with this big cultural agenda. And then back in the 60s again, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which is the homeland for the Council on Foreign Relations, um, had an international meeting in London. And you can see the old newspapers from the day where the, the whole idea was who's going to guide the culture of the world? Will it be Britain or London that does it through their, their movie studio, Pinewood, etc., or Hollywood? And it also included all the music industry for the future. And at the end of about a two-week um, uh, meeting and many, many speeches, they came up with the idea that the culture industry, the government of Britain through its cultural industry department, and the U.S. Uh, cultural div- uh, division as well for di- for, from government, the federal government, 
uh, and local, even state too, they also have their cultural grants to hand out. They would uh, make this happen inside mainly the U.S. And, and Britain would follow, but they still would have some coming from Britain to get the people on board. So they, they came out, of course, with the Beatles and the Stones and things like that. Uh, Theo Adorno from the Frankfurt School, remember, uh, he was heavily involved um, w- with the setting up of the Beatles image and, and so on. He tried beforehand to bring atonal music in. This, I was amazed when I traveled across um, Europe uh, to hear this this old jazz stuff, and, and it was kind of atonal jazz. And that was from the beatnik era. They tried the beatnik era before they brought in pop music and rock music. That was the first long-haired guys. They all wore pullovers, and, and, and they all wore pullovers and had sweaters on, and they're always stoned out their skull. Lived in these dingy clubs, and dark, but all very cool. They're all cool cats, you see, and and uh, played sax, etc. And uh, listen to this kind of atonal, creative jazz. Literally, I couldn't stand for more than a minute. Uh, but it was to destroy all the culture that was before. And that was out at the same time as, as the, they were destroying art itself, you know, the painters and, and bringing in the, the, these, uh, the Picasso stuff, being a big revival of Picasso, uh, to, to make everything disjointed so you had nothing solid and nice to, 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 to hold up your culture, to hold on to everything was to give you this feeling of total change or even falling, uh, falling through uh, time, you might say, uh, into something new which you couldn't understand. Uh, this was a massive psychological operation. And then when they added the drugs to it, the drugs were meant literally uh, to make them far more suggestible and, and incredibly studied. Incredible studies were done in them on, in the, on the under LSD to see if they could still um, function, what they really wanted was some kind of drug that would make them function well with, with still mathematics and so on, but be emotionally flat. Uh, but they couldn't get that with the LSD, so they tried various other drugs and concoctions too, and they're still doing it through regular pharmacy. But um, it's fascinating to see the massive machinery involved to create not just the, the music stars, but the acting stars, as they call them, and uh, because the people follow the stars, it's an ancient saying. They put them up in front of you, or the youth will, will follow that that man or that woman, and um, and you want to be like them, dress like them, and act like them, etc. They're the new role models which supersede the family, the mother and the dad, and so on. And 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 when they're cool and, and even kind of nasty or, or uh, beyond being the cheeky level, the youngsters will, will use those terms too, and to to be cool and have shock value, etc. Then when they came, from, I remember talking to, to Jerry Marsden, and, and, and he was, um, he, he had ferry across the Mersey, old stuff from the early 60s. He was an old fellow when I talked to him, and uh, he said, he, he watched it. I mean, he, he went was through it, he went through, and sang some good songs at the time, very popular, but they were standard songs. He was talking about his home, the ferry across the Mersey, uh, things like that, and he said that's how it used to be in the clubs. The folk went, because it was still man and woman meets up and so on, and often they would end up getting married. That's how you met people, to, a, a mate to get married. It says, and it was happy uh, youngster stuff. There was nothing nasty about it, counterculture or anything, and um, it had a romance about it, you see. But when they brought in this new music uh, and eventually going into the rock, uh, that was out the window. The whole idea, remember, was to separate the bonding aspect from meeting up with a partner and simply have, have sex for sex's sake. And once that had happened enough times, they wouldn't bond for life with anybody and they'd have no children, basically. So it's fascinating to see this. And that, what happened then in the 60s, was what they tried in the 1920s before, by the way, during the Prohibition era. Before Prohibition, there weren't so many young people at all went into bars. It wasn't an exciting uh, thing to do. It's only when you make it a bad thing to do and you have to sneak in and no Joe at the door and so on and get snuck in to drink this illegal booze that became a place that you wanted to go. You see, you're bad and you're a renegade. And they also brought in the, the miniskirt then in the 20s for the Charleston dance and so on. Uh, they promoted the, the sex and, and, and massive drinking and brought coke in as well, by the way, at the same time in big quantities in these clubs to get them hooked on coke. It didn't work because... There was so much sexual fallout from, from uh, uh, unwanted children uh, and uh, venereal diseases and so on. They didn't have penicillin, remember. They didn't have the pill. 
Uh, and so they had this big fallout. So it, it just didn't take the general population. So they simply went back to the drawing board and brought it out in a better fashion. Once they had the pill, they had the antibiotics to cure some of the, the diseases they'd catch. And, and not all of them, mind you. And it's been a, a smash hit ever since. And it's pushed from the top. In London, you think about the whole establishment of the BBC in the 60s. No one worked in the BBC without coming from Oxford. From the top to the bottom. You had to be from Oxford, so it was kept within the establishment. You see, it was a government-owned station. And yet the BBC, with the Oxford accents, uh, brought out the guys at the the beginning uh, to promote pop music, as they called it. Uh, and they, they brought guys on who were, who were falling off their chairs that they just made a, a number one head off because he's drugged out his skull. And you'd see this guy with the suit and tie with the Oxford accent saying, oh, aren't we, aren't we naughty? Tee hee hee as the guy's falling on the floor. So it's, this is all aimed at the youngsters, for goodness sake. Uh, why, why were the upper elite pushing this on the rest of the population who didn't belong to their class? They're talking to a guy from the East End of London who, who dressed in some rags uh, and stoned out his skull who just fallen off his chair. And it's a big laugh. It's a joke. Like, we're really bad. We're bad by, by falling off the chair and being actually stoned out our mind. That was to make it exciting for the youth. And it worked awfully well. Awfully well. It's a, it's a, there's so much to all of this, you know. Yeah. I mean, that, that brings to mind the, um, the Bill Grundy interview. Uh, with uh, mm-hmm. the Sex Pistols, as it were. Um, I don't know, Tom, Thomas, you were kind of in that kind of genre of music. Um, th- what, what would you be your your perception of that now, considering the fact that uh, John Lydon's admitted that he was uh, he was getting into parties in the Houses of Parliament uh, before he was even in the Sex Pistols? Well, I have mixed feelings about it. It's it's. I think if you, uh, watching that clip, you know. Back then, when I was a kid, I thought it was funny. I mean, I just thought the whole thing was funny. That this member of the BBC establishment basically destroys his career on live on TV. But another aspect, too, is that people need to watch that clip again. And how that thing all really kicked off was that Susie Sue, who was only about... She must have been only about 17 at the time, 16 maybe, from Susie and the Banshees, who was there with them. She said to Bill Grundy, um, I love your show, I'm a big fan. And then he started making these kind of uh, sexual over, uh, just suggestions to her, like, I'll see you backstage afterwards. I mean, this is, a, this is a, like an older guy in his 50s. She was like a kid. And how that all began was that Steve Jones reacted to that by saying, you, you dirty old bastard, this kind of thing. And so we were getting an insight into the kind of culture that spawned the likes of Jimmy Savile in that, you know, basically any teenager that walked through the door of Top of the Pops or any anything like that was, was fair game for, you know, whatever, you know, uh, you know, pedophile was working there, you know, that was at the, to tap into them like Savile or the rest of them. Now, so that on that level, I thought it was quite revealing and quite interesting. Then I found out later on about, about Johnny Lydon and you know the whole thing I just don't know what to say yeah, he probably was selected who knows I mean it's just yeah it, you know it's like I used to I used to, when I was that age I used to think that the, the old the old farts were like the Rolling Stones and the Led Zeppelins and stuff like that and I thought you know I was very well aware from an early age that the likes of the Stones and Led Zeppelin were very very average and the only thing keeping them going was this mystique built around them? For instance, like the, the, the Rolling Stones and and Led Zeppelin just play blaze basic American blues. They just it's Lead Belly, it's John Lee Hooker, it's the classic American blues sound. But because they have this mystique surrounding them of being dark or being sinister somehow, you had the Stones with uh, Kenneth Anger and his whole connections with Cr- Crowley and the O. T.O. and on the other side you had also you had Led Zeppelin with Jimmy Page and his connection to all that stuff as well and so that was the only thing that made them interesting because apart from that they're just basic you know white guys copying you know old time American guitar blues there's nothing original about it there's nothing original there's about it there's a very good reason there's, there's a good reason for that though because Remember, you see, the U.S. tried to get 
uh, when they set up all these uh, camps across the US and, and, and so on to train the youth from uni- top universities to become future leaders for the, for the, for the, the Marxist system and, and neo-Trotsky system that was to be blended with the West, basically, which has happened. Um, they, they, through the acoustic era, they, uh, they tried, what they were hoping for inside the US was to get the black population to, to do an uprising. And so that they popularized what they call black music. In fact, that's how they trained initially Bob Dylan. He's from New York, remember? Not from New York, but he's, he's not from the Deep South. Uh, Winscott, Wisconsin. Yeah, and, and so he, for years and years, uh, he had to practice and practice this, this kind of pseudo-nasal kind of back-in-your-throat singing that was kind of, well, what is he? Is he from Mississippi or where? And they did the same thing in Britain uh, with, with uh, their own stones. Uh, I mean, he's a guy, again, who was trained as an economist, Mick Jagger, and uh, he's put out there with, with, his, with his, again, his outfit, his shtick and so on, and his drugged look, and, um, and, uh, and the image is immediately put out as a, he's a star. Before anyone had heard, really listened to any song, a massive machinery went into action. But, but um, he had to sing again. They used to call him uh, uh, the Deep South Londoner, you know. Because that's the accent they tried to give him to popularize the black music. Well, when they found out in the 60s and after some riots they had in parts of New York by the blacks who were against what was happening, they were getting used, as, they, as many of the leaders caught on to by the Communist Party USA, um, uh, then the, the, the party changed its tactics. And, and brought in the rock stuff, and then they thought, well, that would do, and we'll sing it like a, like, it's like a renegade uh, kind of white man for a change. And, and then they started that. And after that, I was there when, when um, they changed the image from the heavy rock bands to the new narcissistic uh, system, the long hair, very well groomed long hair, uh, clean, cleaner looking, very tight, uh, fashionable, but expensive clothing, you know, a, a bit stupid looking, even the leotards and all that, to change the whole image of the man until he became uh, more effeminate. And that was really what the push was about until many of the bands were forming at that time. Uh, were actually t- you know, it actually it recruited guys who who were homosexual. That that was well known in the industry, and you met s- straight guys who couldn't get in. They were excellent musicians and top uh, guitarists and so on and, and keyboard players, but they couldn't get in because that's what the image they wanted to push uh, and so on before they came out with all the punk. Uh, so. Every stage of this has been well managed. And then when you find this Communist Party is totally in cahoots with the powers in the West. Uh, remember the, the Rees Commission that they had in the US in the 1950s uh, to find out why the big foundations like the Rockefeller Foundations and all the other ones uh, were funding what appeared to them, to the government, to be uh, far left parties, communistic parties. And... and um, Norman Dodds, who was uh, who was sent out there from the Congress, the U.S. Congress, he published in his own book. He says, I, "I met the the chairman of the Ford Foundation, and he says we take our orders right from the White House." He says, "He says, and um, the goal is eventually it changed so drastically and radically changed the culture of the West to to, to that of the Soviet Union. There'll be a merger between the two down the road." Uh, with complete different social system, a different cultural system. And remember, the communist system was total central government and authoritarianism. Well, that's what we have today. The appearance of a kind of freedom, but it's all artificial and given to you because you're copying singers or stars or whatever it happens to be, and, the, and lots of entertainment to choose from, but you are actually got a massive centralized government which is becoming more and more authoritarian all the time. It wasn't just for the US, it was for Canada, Britain, and the rest of Europe and so on. So long-term geopolitical strategy, uh, and, and to do so, you had to alter the cultures into a, a now unified culture which will not stand up because the people cannot bond the same way they used to. They don't have the same values. They don't have even this. Well, I used to call it ancestor worship. When you, when you look back at, say, your hometown uh, before they demolished them and built skyscrapers or whatever, um, that was your, where your grandfather walked along this road here or he went down this little stream there and fished uh, and his great-grandfather before. And, and so you had this continuity. Today, the continuity had to be destroyed. So a building's up 10 years sometime and then knock it down again. So there's nothing to relate to between one generation to the next. This was all part of this massive strategy. You know, thousands and thousands of, of think tanks working on different parts of it. 
uh, and, and millions of pages written, uh, professional pages for professionals to learn and how to implement this, this whole strategy. But going back to even Plato's day, Plato talks about the culture industry. He called it the industry in the translation from the Greek. Uh, it, and that included drama, uh, and not just the architecture too, but drama. Uh, drama was licensed back then. Uh, and the traveling troops were authorized to come out and do certain authorized plays in different city-states across the ancient Greece. There had so many islands, thousands of islands. And uh, everyone had to, to by law, attend them. Even the slaves had to go and watch them. Because they said that's where the youth are going to get their, their morals for a strong morality, a, co- a continuity of culture, and a continuity of control. Uh, they also talked, they also, Plato even says that musicians should be licensed because they have the ability to stir up the youth to rebellion uh, with, with the emotional impact of music, uh, you, coupling with right kind of words and so on and themes. So this is a very old tradition. We, we are taught at school, we just evolve through generation to generation and things just happen. That's the accidental view of history. And, um, and nothing's further from the truth. The 20th century into the 21st century were to be where all sciences, over people, all sciences were to come to the fore and, and rule on behalf of the dominant minority of, of the heavy, the, the wealthy financial families. So that scientific um, control is what this is all about. And you must, you must always grab culture completely and, and uh, you direct it uh, where is to go. Uh, Thomas, um, Alice said many times that uh, you know you can't help liking the music, and he just mentioned the scientific aspect to that. Um, and you know, uh, there are bands supposedly out there um, telling us how it is. You know, I, I mean, Muse come to mind, uh, although I'm not a, a fan of theirs at all. But there, I mean, there are smaller ones like Killing Joke and uh, even smaller uh, Anti Flag and people like that. Uh, I mean, Thomas, do you, do you think there are any any bands out there at all who are for real? Not famous ones, I don't think. And if they are, they always get co-opted. I mean, the whole punk rock thing was supposed to be about anarchy. I mean, in no time you had, like, this clash Sandinistas and, you know, wearing T-shirts with uh, Brigade Rossi on it, the, the, you know, the, the Italian Red Brigade, who were basically a communist group that were created by Propaganda Due. Uh, the, the Vatican Freemasonry you had like the red wedge things you had someone like Paul Weller who actually didn't really come out from a political stance in the beginning uh, ends up you know hanging out for a while with people like Neil Kinnock and um, Billy Bragg I mean hardcore Marxists although to be fair he did pull himself out and said that it was all a con that he was led into but this whole thing of steering, constantly steering into into Marxism, it always has to go with Marx. It's always some kind of Marxist endgame and all this stuff, whether it's uh, pop music or visual arts or even like within alternatives. This same we have now, you know, Russell Brand ste- steering them all back into Marxism again. It's always, it's always, tr- you know, I've often found it interesting at thirty three revolutions per minute for an LP. Are you telling us something there? But it's, 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 it's just. It's 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 ne- it's it's always frustrating to see someone that enters the music business that may have something to say, and then it's gone. It's 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 whipped off into fluff, nonsense, or into the Marxist thing. I mean, I, I actually I actually yeah. think that the, the stuff about like even bands like like U two, yeah, they're a big corporate machine now. They're a big establishment machine. But I've seen interviews. If people go back and look at old interviews of the likes of, of Bono on, on their early American tours, they're really, really ripping into the establishment to a surprising level. Next thing you know, they're, go, they're, they're being put on their blues phrase, their blues thing, and then they're, the next thing you know, they're playing for presidents. It's, it's almost like what Bill Hicks said about when somebody gets elected, that they take into the president of the United States, that they take him into a room behind the Oval Office, and they showed them what really happened in Dealey Plaza that day the JFK. It's the same thing with the music business. You may have integrity, you may have the right feel, the right uh, the right drive in your soul, but there's a certain point where you get to and it's as clear as day and where you get what what was his name? Bob Dylan again said it to Ed Bradley on 60 minutes, I made a deal with the devil, the biggest baddest guys of them all. 
And that's what happens. You're, you're, you're given, like in the mafia, like any kind of criminal cartel, you're given an offer you can't refuse. Yeah, I've actually got yeah, a, a Along with these off. offers, too. Sorry, along with these offers, come. come. Sorry, carry, on, carry on, Alan. Carry on. Yeah, I was going to say that along with the offers, I mean, it isn't just financial or doors opening for you. Um, or things being taken care of you, like lawsuits that would come your way that get deflected away altogether, things like that. You also get uh, superior health care that's not available to, to anybody in the general public. You, you, you can get up to the higher levels of things like that. Um, at life extension, to an extent, you might call it. That's why they live so long. But So there's many different things that are given as, 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 as it comes their way. But um, when you go into who they put out to get this whole thing really kicked off in the 60s, uh, this new, more organized, uh, sy- systematic technique they were using, uh, well-planned, and with the Pentagon involved and so on. If you go into e- even Morrison, they always make a big deal about Morrison and the doors and so on. When the, the ships in the Gulf of Tonkin and the U.S. Uh, uh, warships were supposedly, uh, had possibly had torpedoes fired at them, this was this, the con that got the war started, you see. They wanted a war. The Navy Admiral in charge was Admiral George Stephen Morris, and that was his father. You, you'll find if you go through the top guys they put out, they really kicked us off. Every one of them's father uh, was deep into the, the, high up in the Pentagon. Um, Frank Zappa's dad himself uh, was up in the top military establishment for chemical and biological warfare. Uh, they were all, even, even Madonna. You know, they came out and said, oh, I turned up in New York or London or something with a pair of ballet shoes and five bucks. Up to rubbish, because her brother came out and says, you know, no, our dads are we got a long military uh, family. That's where we all came from, high up in the Pentagon. So this is a standard thing. So many of them are actually picked and groomed very early for their acting role uh, as leaders of the culture industry. Because you put out the leaders there, you, 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 you debase the morality even more, and all these young fans, especially women, will start copying Madonna, and then they bring up later on Gaga and the rest of them and so on, and, and just push the envelope step, step by step. This is all planned before they even picked Madonna, that you get right down to Gaga. I'm sure even the names were picked before they even picked out Gaga. Uh, th- this, is the, this is how detailed and well-organized all of this system is. Yeah. Uh, it, always, it always amazed me, too, how if, like you said, that they, they are picked from the right families. The, the, in the case of Jim Morrison, there's a photograph of him as a clean-cut ute on the, the bridge of his father's battleship literally months before he ends up as this long-haired rebel. Very, very strange mm-hmm. transition in such a short time. Because he goes from, like, straight-laced army brat to rock god, Dionysian sex god overnight. That was always been a very weird one to me. Another thing, too, and also, is that if you don't... I was going to say, if you, if you don't come from those families, they have a tendency to kill you off. They, it's like they uh, don't, they don't yeah. want genuine people with talent working, like they say, with, like, with talent and ability who are popular. They seem to have a very high mortality rate. That's right. Yeah. And, and Zappa himself, too, uh, was groomed and, and given lots of TV spots, again, in a suit and tie when he was, uh, when he was uh, about 13, 14, 15, 16. Every year he was given little TV spots and silly little shows just to get him used to the audience uh, and, and managing himself in front of people and so on. But suit and tie, short hair, cut the whole thing. So uh, this is standard stuff, yeah. And David Bowie as well, he was a regular on American shows like the Donna, the Donna Shaw <laughs> show. And so was uh, Alice Cooper, and they were supposed to be countercultures. And here they were entrenched with Bing Crosby in the very, the very uh, heart of the American entertainment establishment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And you, even you start Bowie off. I mean, uh, Bowie started off with the Traveling Road Show. This thing had about six or seven tractor trailers, these massive American-type trailers, doing his tours with all the incredible... No one, no one had that back then. The, the, the cost of it alone uh, and, and the transportation of it all and, and, the, and the hundreds of technicians all involved, uh, that's how they launched him. And he comes on the stage dressed in a, in a, in a, in a little... Um, um, pouch for his, you know what, uh, nothing else on, uh, dressed up and, and got with paints all over his face, uh, and he's down on his knees on stage, and everybody was shocked, saying, what the hell is this? 
And, and who really launched them? The BBC did it again. They did massive shows on, on his roadshow all along to make sure it was launched uh, and to, to, make, to launch this new... He's a new kind of male. He's, he's not quite this or not quite that. He's... What is he? Uh, and, and going back even further, <laughs> to set up again step by step, they started it off with Elvis Presley. Uh, and Elvis Presley was taught how to, they call him Elvis the pelvis. Get the pelvis going. A really uh, disgusting thing at that era, at that time. Nothing today because we're so we're so debased. But um, and he was trained by the same guy, and the same guy who controlled the whole group, Johnny Cash, all of them. They made them all stars as one man. And the same thing happened in Britain. At the time, you had Cliff Richard under the one guy. Uh, the, 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 there was a guy called Brown as well. He had a few songs and different ones. They had the same technique with a small clique in every country, all in communication with each other, who knew the techniques, who were given a complete authority of, this, of the establishment and the governments to launch these people into the new culture. Yeah. I suppose we had, we had Tom Jones, of course, in, the, in, the, in Britain, who was a kind of a counter to Elvis Presley for, for British folk, I guess. Yeah, and they launched him as a, as a descendant of a minor, which was nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when Elvis Presley appeared on the the uh, Ed Sullivan show, the publicity machine made an enormous deal out of the fact that the camera couldn't show below his his midriff. Yeah, they right. only showed the top. Now that was to deliberately generate this, as you said, you were talking about earlier on, this idea of the forbidden fruit. The young people want to see the bottom half of Elvis. And it's all it's so they deliberately create the the forbidden fruit in order to attract mm-hmm. people towards it. They're very deep. Well, it's, it's worth always make it, absolutely. I'll, I'll always make it bad. You must you must make it naughty and bad. You see, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, then you have. I mean, that's I mean. There's, 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 a sex, there's a sex pistols in a nutshell, isn't it? Ban them. Ban them yeah. from every public venue, and then everybody wants to see them. Yeah. Another one for me is this the dissociation kind of thing they use, very much in this you know the idea of like uh, Aurelian Newspeak in these cultural memes. You have all these Vietnam War movies that show that were made after the war was made, and they always show the the, the American troops walking in slow motion through the jungle to a. Ironically, it's always an anti-war protest song rock song, you know, this kind of like by some band like Clear Creed's Clearwater Revival yes, right. or a Marvin Gaye song. So you have this, this association of the anti war kind of rock anthem being used as a promotional film to glamorize war when you have Charlie Sheen and people like and you know people like that walking in slow motion through the jungle while you know Oh, you know they're playing something by by Jefferson Airplane. You have the two, the dichotomy of the two together that causes a kind of uh, a psychic dissociation in people, where people now who are into those mu- into that music now believes that it's somehow cool because you're in the army marching yeah. to a song that's against war. It's 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 they've total actually put out documentaries. Frankfurt School stuff. They've, yeah. they've actually put out documentaries. They put, yeah, they, they brought documentaries out now. Uh, and I think they even re- use them in recruitments, but it's from actual footage of guys inside the armoured military vehicles that are really racing across the desert, and it's got these, this heavy metal music in the background, whoa, 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 and, and they're all tough, and, you know, and, and this is, the, this, this is yeah, you, you create what you want. You, it's so easy, to, if you have the power and influence in society, to create the kind of special areas, uh, like troops or whatever it is that you actually want and you also have a culture within the country um, that will emulate that too. Uh, you see that with the rap music. Uh, you, you had years of, of, the, of the promotion, by the way. Blacks didn't promote this stuff from the top. If, if, if the culture industry did not want that stuff to get pushed out there, it, you never heard of it. Uh, but they pushed it from the very, very top. The whole culture industry did it at the very top. And, and, and then you end up, well, kill cops, kill cops, all this stuff. And then you start getting this happening. And you see where it is today. This is all to get the the the, the dissension, the tension built up inside the U.S. Uh, therefore, they want a, a time when there will be definitely riots, uh, combined with economic problems too, uh, etc., to bring in again the next part of the new society. There's no doubt about that at all in, in my mind. Yeah. I mean, when they when they split up the the African American family in the United States, 
uh, they brought out songs like Papa Was a Rolling Stone to entrench the idea that Daddy will never be home. And so they grow up with this culture of listening to the song Papa Was a Rolling Stone, you know, that kind of thing, where he laid his hat was his home. And so you grow up believing that, like, if you're an African-American youth in Detroit or New York or New Jersey or whatever, you actually grow up believing, well, Daddy does, Daddy's not home because I'm aware of a song called Papa Was a Rolling Stone. And then they try to make out, oh, it's a statement of the times. No, it's not. It's predictive programming. Yes, it is. Yep, that's cool. And why get a job and try to get self, some self-respect? Never mind other people's respect. Get self-respect in a way that's not going to harm you or other people and actually benefit you and give you a bit, a bit of peace as well rather than get self-respect inside a, a gang because uh, you're the coolest dude and baddest dude there is. But that's what's been promoted for years now and that was all deliberately because it, was, it wasn't white men that promoted the rap, believe you me. It's, it's not blacks that control the culture industry. Uh, but but but, but uh, it, it was it was a white man that pushed all this, and I, I say white, uh, and there's there's more things involved in that too that tend to lead the culture industry as well within it. Yeah, yeah there's there, 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 Well, in terms of um, like black music in general, I mean, if we go back to the the old image of the the, the black congregations in the churches, um, I mean, was was that like a purely good thing? Was that a, a, a genuine kind of uh, thing that went on and then that had to be co-opted because it was actually like the, the foundation of the local communities I mean, I mean we, 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 we've, we've gone yeah, from yeah. there to gangster rap I mean gangster rap's got to be the most pernicious you're, you're, you're dead uh, on you're, you're, thing. you're dead on here's, here's what they came out with uh, they came out with this in, in the 60s again from the communist party USA and their own writings uh, if you go back you'll find all this stuff and they talked about uh, they couldn't get the blacks to revolt because of this, this, how they held on strongly to this, what was to them traditional uh, Christianity and gospel music and so on. They, they, that, that was was holding them back. Uh, they couldn't get them to completely re- revolt, so they've simply tried to eliminate all of that and get the young women. See, it was mainly that their mums and so on who always kept that tradition of Christianity and, and here's how it should right and wrong and so on. Uh, and so to get the young women to be ultra, ultra promiscuous as well, that's why you had, had the MTV and all that promoting the dancers that were pretty well humping each other on stage, you know, in front of the camera. That's really what was all simulating. Uh, then get the young women into it too, uh, bring in an atheistic culture, uh, and then you control them completely. That was, that's been awfully successful. Yeah. Well, the, the, what they call the... Those 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 gospels, what they call used to call them Negro spirituals. That was basically the whole song uh, body of songs by the likes of Pete Seeger and Peter Paul and Mary. All they did was take those those old Southern Church songs and put them on a, a really namby pamby acoustic guitar version. And suddenly, in one yeah. swell, in one fell swoop, the whole the whole tradition of indigenous and natural and organic Black American gospel music, bang, it's gone. I mean, that's we, right. We, that's right. Can we say the same thing about the traditional black um, blues musicians who were actually singing about kind of th- their own lives as such? Oh yeah, there was that. There was that that piss take that they made of the Beatles, the Ruttles that Eric Idle made. Uh, All you need is cash. There's a very funny but very telling scene in it. He goes, uh, "Here I am in Louisiana, the home of the blues, a music music written by black people, played almost exclusively by whites." And that was really, you know, it was a satirical, funny way of looking at it. Absolutely, all these th- things like Irish and Scottish and English folk music, the the, uh, the spirituals in America, or the, the blues, they were all rooted in real organic musical traditions that bonded communities together, that spoke of people's pain, that spoke of people's uh, their, their desires in life to transcend the situation they were in. And every single last one of them, you know, you look at like Irish folk music. It's ended up with Michael Flatley on a stage with about a hundred, you know, girls in short skirts dancing around them. You have the the, the spiritual stuff. Is all rap, rappers now have that? Well, they're they're rapping about like you know what they're going to do to their hoe and stuff like that. You have like uh, these kind of spiritual gospel singing in the background, and the uh, folk music. Well, that was destroyed years ago. I mean, even bands like the Pogues. I mean, I don't. I, I never got the appeal of them. They just took Irish folk music and just basically just played it directly as it is, and added this sort of drunken element to it to always yeah. keep the idea of the Irish man as being this hapless drunk. 
you know, this, this, mm-hmm. this stupid drunk. And if you look at them, they were all people like Shane McGowan, the leader of the, the Pogues, was an English public school boy. Mm-hmm. And here he was playing the professional drunken paddy on stage. Yeah, you remember too that even during the 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 the, the, the seventies, uh, they were bringing guys in from wealthy families, very wealthy families, Oxford and Cambridge and so on, um, who decided that because their dads were so powerfully and rich and well connected, they wanted to be rock stars, and they were teaching them how to speak in Cockney, with the Cockney accent, the London accent. Uh, to try to get the image, and that they were successful with quite a few of them. Actually, well, naturally with the money behind them and and a bit of acting lessons and so on. Uh, plus, if you mime pretty good and get other people to sing for you or even play for you, it, it, and a lot of that's happened by the way too. I, I've played in stuff where, where none of the guys in the band actually played at all, but they went through all the all the, the, the video discs and appeared here and there and played to tape. But everything is what you see on television is a show, It's show business. It's show business. It's not real. Even exposés on something's not real either, including how bad the band is or how drunk they got last night or who dived out at the second floor in the swimming pool. That, that's all stage stuff. They use stuntmen, things like that, and, and, and written in advance. I mean, you, you wouldn't believe how, how... It's all show business. All of it, yeah. The, the, Cockney accent, the Cockney accent thing is interesting because I've seen videos of Jimmy Page uh, from Led Zeppelin and... Uh, Mick Jagger from the Stones when they were both in school, in secondary school and they sounded like Prince William a few years later all oh man Kate down the east end you know we, we were giving it up large and all this is like mockney kind of thing going on I mean it, right. again there's so many examples that even the classical violinist uh, Nigel Kennedy who they made a kind of a pop star out of back in the 80s and 90s there's a, I, I've seen he does the same thing there oh Nigel Kennedy I play the violin, oh, you know, this kind of thing. And there are also interviews of him when he was a kid. And he, 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 again, he sounds like Prince Harry or Prince William. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. And I mean, I've, I've, met, uh, I've met the Stones because they were in the same recording studio as I was at one point up in, in Scotland, actually. David Balfour ran it. And uh, he'd had hits himself. I mean, he came from a long lineage of, of cultural experts, believe you me, in this industry. And um, he had about three or four different names, and that's the first thing you learn is use different names. But um, they were going in at the time, and I had a chat with them, and and uh, you're exactly right how they actually speak in, in reality. And same with with most other ones as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I've met Jimmy Page too in his house when he got it up in, in Scotland. I had a big party there for different people, and all went, and and uh, that was Alistair Crowley's old house, in fact. Yeah. Old Skid Manor, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've... I heard you mention, Alan, that you were, you were invited to a, was it a women's a women's event, a, like a, a a women's lib event or something, and they they asked they approached you to do certain songs in a certain way or something. No, it was actually just I, mean, I thought it was just a, a club in Toronto uh, that, that um, I, I just popped in. I didn't know what it was. It was just I thought I'd go and get a beer actually, and um, and there were some guys singing up on the stage and so on in a small club, and um, maybe a couple hundred people. And uh, I thought oh, it was just a local thing, and and someone says to me, "Can you play?" I says, oh, "I said a little bit. I always say a little bit." And he says, "Could you give us a song?" So I, I went up there and sung some of the songs and so on. And this woman approached me and says, uh, "Can you sing something radical?" I, I, I says, well, "What do you mean radical? What what kind of radical song? And what do you what, what would you say is radical? <laughs> How would you define it?" Uh, and it was all anti-establishment stuff. And the place was called the Trojan Horse. Now, they had different Trojan Horses, interesting name too, all set up by the, by the Canadian government and funded by the Canadian government for counterculture. And the people who were set up to, to help run it had to try and pick people to, 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 to turn up at different rallies and things and do really radical anti-establishment songs paid by your government, for goodness sake. Uh, and I was, I was rather astonished at that. And when I was there, uh, I turned up a second night, uh, about a week later, and there's a woman from the federal government who worked for the federal government came in. They all knew her. She was a lesbian, by the way, because she hugged every female there in a strange way. Uh, and one of them told me that she was. And uh, I thought, what the hell is this? And, and the U.S. tax, I mean, like the Korean taxpayer was funding all of this. And then all across Canada, these kind of clubs. Britain had the same in some areas too, by the way. I, I had to find out when I was really young why every government since World War II 
the Soviets, the France, Britain, Germany, all the countries, the US, Canada, just show you why we all had a department of culture. If you, the people, are the culture, why would you need a department of culture? Well, this was for, for culture guidance and creation. And they give out the grants to novelists, to, to film producers, film writers, film writers, uh, musicians, uh, uh, songwriters. They, they put out uh, 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 the, the grants uh, for guys often who couldn't get a job anywhere, anywhere else because uh, they got a chip in their shoulder or something. Uh, but they put them out there. As long as you put these things in your novel, these topics, you know, up, upgrade, update like a computer program, the, morali- the new morality of the public and put it in even cartoons. You supply. You got your state and U.S. state ones, Canadian province, provincial ones. They get the grants out too. Uh, they call them to artist grants, and so did the federal governments as well. They all do this. So all of culture is actually guided. If it's to be successful, that is, because you can only be allowed to be successful. Yeah, I know. I know. There's a, yeah, it's a all about taking care of this kind of thing. There's a, there's a club in London. I was going to come back, come back to you, Thomas, on this one. I know there's a club in London that. Uh, that runs these kind of events with other musicians or comedians or whatever, and it's it's run by uh, like the likes of Charlie Skelton uh, and these kind of people who are supposedly at Bilderberg protesting, you know, uh, all run by the Guardian newspaper. But um, are there any such uh, venues in Dublin or Ireland in general, Thomas? Well, it's the same as anywhere else. There's even a rock and roll high school here where kids are. The government get the same. It's like a Juilliard kind of thing and they you know they put them into the they teach them what they expect of them in the music business and like nobody nobody comes out of it famous or interesting it's the same idea again they're they're programmed and to be to be rock and rollers as long as they're this, this they're doing what the, what the teachers who are all like professors and very few of them have musical backgrounds are telling them to do it's just, it goes on everywhere i'm aware of nothing i mean the music industry here is dead now really compared to what it used to be when I was a kid. The day, it was much, it was much more organic and natural here years ago. But nowadays, it's, it's, just as, it's just as horrible and commercial as everywhere else. And again, it's the same, the same thing. The, it's what I, one constant, I mentioned at the beginning there, about a constant that I, I'd encountered in, in this, is that the, it's always well, well-to-do people from old families, old money families, aristocrats, and it always seems to come back to protecting them through, uh, through this weird kind of dissociative idea of bringing in Marxism and so on. And yeah, it, it, that's it's, it's been like it's the same. The people who run the music business here, they're all they're all rich. They're all people with money. And I've seen it all my life, and that'll never. Ch- I mean, even the people again, you've got a much better chance of making it in the music business if your parents are are billionaires. Yeah, like Carly Simon. She came from the Simon and Schuster publishing family, and there's been there's so much of this goes on. Just like uh, Jim Morrison, because these people come from the families, and they're, they're, it's already known what's expected of them when they get into power, so they don't have to be trained. I often found it very interesting how the even in the '60s in England, when you had all these bands first making, and everyone from the small faces to the kinks, how they all bought stately homes of the aristocrats in the countryside. Basically, what they were doing was, was plowing that money back into the aristocrats. So if they were someone from a working-class person from the East End of London, say someone like Steve Marriott from the Small Faces, it was almost like they were expected to purchase with their millions a home, a stately home, a mansion in the countryside from some lord or lady. So immediately you had a transference of cash from the elite into a working class person, but then they were expected to transfer that money back into the elite again. It always goes back to this kind of like aristocratic culture, subculture pulling all the strings. Alan? Yeah, it's pretty well how it is. You, you'll find though that um, in the early 1900s, that's when the big push was on from it within the US. Uh, to destroy all culture. It was quite open in New York. In fact, if you, you can go and get hundreds of books published by the U.S. Um, Communist Party based in New York City. They published all the books. They republished all the Lenin books and, and so on, Stalin and various, all these different, right to the very end and got away with it. Too. No one came down on them and said, you can't do this or it's going a bit too far. Supposedly advocating revolution to, to destroy your entire culture and way of life. That's what it was about, to destroy your culture and real life. All culture and everything to do with culture had to be destroyed and then remade in a new image. 
And so they came out with the, 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 the Novu art at the time, the early art, which was like, like the Picasso stuff, you know, the schizophrenic faces that are torn in half and things and eyeball at the top and one in the chin. And they called this art. And here's a, here's a technique that they used. They already had the clique at the top of cultural leaders who owned the art industry. And, and, and once again, a prof- some guy who's a, called an expert says, that, oh, this is a fantastic, uh, creative work of art, worth millions, you see. And it's a piece of rubbish. The king has no clothes idea. But because it's, a, it's someone so wealthy and talks in his very posh accent, and all that, then he, he must be quite right. So you look at this thing upside down, you stand your head and try to look at it too, and you... And, and you say, well, I guess it's, well, you're just, you're just not seeing what he's trying to portray there, nonsense like that. Well, the, Guggen- the Guggenheim Foundation, or a, a family, started to buy all this stuff up to make it popular, a big, big part of the U.S. culture. And today they still fund it all, too, buying this rubbish and promoting this as the greatest art ever made. Ev- everything that was dissociative, disjointive of culture, morality, even sanity itself, was pushed out there uh, as the best that we have. All the old paintings uh, that gave you nostalgic, emotional feeling or something of beauty had to be destroyed, and that went for, uh, along with movies now, too. Uh, you see how the base they all are. Uh, you wouldn't want to live in some of these movies, the places they show you, because they're so debased and they cuss and swear and it's just the F word every second sentence. Uh, and But that's what they've been pushing, pushing. And then the music thing too, you take you right down to rap and at the very end of when you've taken it all down, you wrap it up and that's where they called it rap. You know. Thomas, we've already actually gone 20 minutes over what we were supposed to do, so I don't know if you guys want to carry on a bit more. Um, I suppose that the, the obvious question is what's coming next? I mean, where do you, where do you see the, the music going now? Thomas? Well, I think the music industry is basically dead in terms of actual anyone from the bottom trying to make a living or, uh, from it because there's, the record companies don't promote, put money into bands anymore. They, you know, they, they, they deliberately create that free download thing in order to sort of take the economic power out of up-and-coming bands, uh, giving them an, an impetus to try and make it. And the only money that's in the music industry now is that our out acts that are, are picked through the, the shows like American Idol and all the other rubbish, and they're put out there. They're the only ones given the promotional budgets. The days of the, the singer who actually, or the band who made you, came up from the bottom, got a record deal and whatever, as bad as that system was there was still a chance to actually progress somehow That's not, that doesn't exist anymore, that whole economic aspect has been taken out the future as far as I can see is that the, the music is, it has become appalling, it's unlistenable now and I, I know it's not my age because I've, I've been listening to all kinds of experimental music all my life and I'm not like close mind that are locked into one kind of sound and very open-minded musically uh, the music that you hear on the on the the radio these days is is just bizarre it's just uh, repetitive sounds and tones repeated over and over again there's often no melody or harmony there's no hook it's it purely it sounds schizophrenic in fact it, it, it it's almost like designed to create to, to make people schizophrenic so in terms of the music industry, that it's gone. It's always been a disaster, but it's finished now. There'll always be people, and that will want to create from their heart or from their soul. We'll never hear from them. Uh, they'll always do it, and, and hopefully that long may that continue. Learn instruments and so on. But in terms of actually a, a bright future for some kind of big music scene or, or, or the day when true talent is allowed to shine, that's never going to happen because it's it's more controlled than ever. They didn't have to license music as Plato wanted. They, all they had to do was take complete and total control over what the, the musical output was and filter everything. And they've been doing that for so long now that I can't see. I can't. What's next? What's next is more drivel, more trash. And hopefully as a counter insurgency to that, more young people who say this it's it's clearly garbage it's clearly controlled uh, my friends and i are going to make our own music sing our own songs and follow our own path so there's there's good and bad but in terms of the music industry i i don't think we i think imagine the worst we're going you know they're always going to push for the worst we're on a you know as this civilization continues to deteriorate we will go the way of rome and when, when Rome first began, the Colosseum used to host basically boxing matches and, and poetry recitals and plays. 
towards the end, they were having, you know, people with Down syndrome being torn apart by wild animals. Well, I can guarantee you that's the, that's eventually where the pop the musical industry will take it that will be the end game they will they will they will it's been de- it's been done before it'll go increasingly shocking and increasingly shocking to what we will look back to the days of a uh, hardcore gangster rap and we will think it's innocent and wholesome compared to what's coming down the line mm-hmm. Alan? And it's also uh, the end products of, of uh, a war. It's a war, it's an agenda. And the war was on the, all of society, not just in one country, but across an, an awful lot of societies. When it brought out, the, again, the Picasso-type nonsense, it was, the movement was to make uh, apathy, uh, nihilism, uh, the yuck feeling of nothingness left in you when you looked at this rubbish, uh, nothing of beauty to look at, etc., so the beauty that makes you human and all the emotions that go with it uh, that also add to the culture that gave you your culture in the past have been pretty well annihilated until you had this lost sound and, and lo- young lost voices almost wailing. Uh, again, narcissistically, it's, it's not for us or we or we all share this or whatever in common. It, it's to do with bringing in a narcissistic I am me uh, exactly what Bertrand Russell and others talked about. They would bring in, they've done it awfully successfully. Uh, the, 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 you're, you're not really um, connected with other people. Right down with, again, with the internet war, the texting, they'd rather text each other at the table rather than talk to each other. It, it's all worked superbly well, you know. And, and whatever they want in culture is promoted from the top as being, you've got to do this if you want to be in the in crowd. If you don't do this, you're not in the in crowd. So if you sit and still talk across the, the table at a, at a, a restaurant or whatever, uh, you, you're square, you're, you're odd, you're, you're weirdo, uh, text each other, you're in the in crowd. It's been awfully successful, unfortunately, this whole war. And unfortunately, when, when you've lost so much and folk cannot relate to anything that made you strong in the past, that gave every generation a vision of hope and prosperity or whatever it happened to be, uh, um, uh, then you're in a state of apathy, like like the sci-fi movies that started churning out about the future back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You're living amongst rubble of a depressed economy, everything's gone, living in rubble. You have this private global army that's, that's bashing the head all the time or killing you. Because they are the winners, you, you know they can always hire the, the the hoods to be in the military and such a, a system. Um, that's what they've been projecting for years, and really that's what they want. I think when you look at the the the, um, the big think tank for NATO that did the report, and I put it up on my website at cutting three metrics dot com in the archive section, ninety pages they came out with it for the NATO countries and the British military. This is the big think tank that projects the future of what's coming down. They're going to turn the world eventually into city-states, uh, no more countries. And these will be privately owned city-states by a very rich elite run by, uh, on behalf of the elite, uh, you have the scientific, the expert-run community society. In the meantime, you'll have what Huxley talked about in Brave New World. You'll have the kind of barbarians living outside the gates, living in the rubble of what used to be rural areas and all the rest of it. But they'll die off uh, over the years until they're all gone. That's what they also portrayed in so many movies that also coincided with the kind of debased, degenerative, nihilistic music they've been throwing out there for years. Uh, it all, all comes together at this time. And they want the new financial system to be brought in eventually through another big crash, which is all organized, of course, by one group of banks that run the world. Uh, the, the, the World Bank, uh, set up by the private organization, uh, Royal Institute for International Affairs. Uh, they set up the IMF. They own that, too. They own, uh, they own the world's money supply, basically, and the lending supply. So they're going to bring in a new, a new system, very degenerate, because the future is for a much smaller population of those they deem fit to go through it, not all those who, who presently exist and have the right by being born here to have the same rights as everybody else. They don't believe in that at all. They're, they're very eugenically orientated. And if you look at the real, real Trotskyist Marxist type that they keep calling themselves now, it's the same eugenics uh, elitist movement as the, the wealthy financial elite ha- ha already had. It's one and the same thing. There are no sides in this. There's only one monopoly for the world monopoly. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard um, quite a few lyrics uh, over the past well, the past decade, I suppose, uh, talking about too many people and uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, I think of uh, like a uh, new model army. 
I mean, they, they, they talk about this kind of stuff, uh, people starving because there's too many of them and all this garbage, you know. Um, Thomas, the, the final word to yourself? Uh, I can't really think of much more to say. I think we've covered it comprehensively. Well, I'm just glad that, you know, it's a, the, for me the biggest dilemma is I'm a music fan and I love music, okay? But I, I also, I, I never, I don't buy into the pop star, rock star thing. If if I hear a piece of music, I like it. I will like it. If I hear a band, I don't really care. I, I do not. I've always never. I've been fortunate that I've never been really influenced by the lyrics. To me, it was just a nice guitar sound or a nice drum sound. That was enough for me. So I think for those of us, uh, we should, you know, in, you know, enjoy music if it makes you feel good. Enjoy it if, if you like the sound. But always remember that you don't have to buy into the whole package. You can uh, just just take it what you hear, what you like, and discard the rest. Because the rest is probably, what the, what the, what the good music is, is a lure and a bait to get you into the control system. And that's what they're after. Don't take the lure, don't take the bait, just enjoy, just, and just enjoy it for what it is and detach. And that to me is what, what I would say is the best way to deal with that I know you're still playing uh, Thomas and uh, Alan I heard you say at Christmas you hadn't picked a guitar up for a year so uh, I hope you do this year sometime and uh, we get a tune out of you at Christmas yeah. again <laughs> well, yeah. okay okay I'll folks uh, thanks, thanks very much guys and uh, hopefully we'll do this again sometime on a completely different topic um, we'll leave it at that